Okay, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for joining us again. We are actually uh, coming into today and we're going to make one of my favorite dishes, which is Ontario Lamb Rack. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the product and some of the cooking methods. I've introduced a couple of really cool cooking methods that we use in the kitchen. Uh, and please, again, feel free to ask any questions that you have along the way. Okay. Uh, again, we're going into Ontario lamb, so lamb and sheep. Uh, so is sheep the same as lamb? Uh, lamb is actually a baby sheep. So some is, uh, lamb is actually a sheep that's less than 12 months old, okay? Uh, we've chosen the rack today, one of the prized cuts, an expensive cut, but for me, uh, probably one of the best cuts uh, that are available out of the lamb, depending on application and cooking method. Uh, and I brought in a couple of different, um, the ways you can receive it in the butcher and give you an idea of how we prepared it. We did a lot of work in advance because it does take time to cook. Uh, so we do have some sous vide -ing. I'm gonna to talk to you about sous vide and reverse sous vide, and then we have it from just a raw form as well, okay? So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get my gloves on, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about the rack and what we did to prepare it and get it ready for sous vide, okay? So let me just get my gloves on here. Uh, we are using an Ontario product. For me, I've used a lot of products over the year. I've used New Zealand, I've used Australian, which was very popular for a long time. Back in the day, we used to use Colorado or Washington State, which is not as available these days in Canada as it used to be, probably because of price and importing costs. Uh, a very good product, the Washington State, mainly priced for the size of the eye. The eye is enormous, so a very large piece of lamb. Uh, New Zealand is probably the most common you'll find in the grocery store, widely available. Uh, and then Australian, uh, in a lot of restaurants, they, they choose uh, Australian as well, and it's very uh, good price point. Even some of the Ontario lamb is more expensive than the Australian uh, products, so people choose to go Australian for price point. Uh, but for me, from a flavor profile, the Ontario lamb is the best of both worlds. So it does, it is a particularly, uh, in Ontario, it is mostly a grass-fed product, whereas in the US it's uh, grain-fed, uh, and, and that's why the notes of the uh, flavor of the lamb in the US is very similar to beef. So you think about a beef product, uh, it's mild lamb flavor, but lamb is uh, raised on grass, so feeding it grass really changes the, the uh, flavor, it gives it a little bit more of a gamier note, but for me, Ontario lamb is not quite as gamey as New Zealand. So New Zealand to me, even though it's a bland flavor protein, for me, it does have a really stronger game flavor. Uh, but the Ontario is kind of the best of both worlds. Also the Ontario, the size of the eye can be quite good. So uh, when you're buying lamb at the grocery store, usually it's by the weight of the rack. So they'll say 28, uh, sorry, 26, 28. So that's 26 to 28 ounces. Uh, 32 up would be 32 ounces up and they're usually eight bone racks sometimes you'll see a seven bone rack but for the most part they're eight bone racks and uh, the eye what I'm talking about is this uh, cut of meat around the side here okay what we do when we're preparing them and this is probably the way you'll find them in the grocery store maybe broken down without a cap this is the cap here which I'm going to remove and I'll show you uh, but this is called Frenching the rack when we clean between the bones and it's mainly for presentation and a lot of this is fat uh, and some of it we call it lamb finger muscle uh, and we'll eliminate that and I'll use it in the sauce but uh, I bring them down even further and you'll see that in a second okay so I'm just going to show you how I'm going to prepare that lamb so the first thing I'm going to do uh, with this um, this is completely Sam asks uh, it's lamb season right it is lamb season, Sam. It is absolutely. So when you talk about a spring lamb, what are we talking about? We're talking about a lamb that usually is butchered between, I believe it's March and October, uh, and it's four months old. So spring lamb is what we're talking about, right? So lamb is particularly great this time of the year, okay? Uh, so with this, this lamb itself, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna re remove this big piece of, of, it's called a cap. I'm just gonna take this down and completely remove it from the lamb itself, okay? So I'm just gonna peel this back. I mentioned to make sure that if you're buying it at the butcher store that you're asking for the chine bone to be removed, uh, unless you have a bandsaw at home you wanna use, uh, but there's a bone that would run right along here that I connect it to the rib, and for you to cut through 
uh, when you're eating dinner, it'd be very difficult, okay? So you wanna have that chine bone removed. There's also a muscle, a little nerve that runs along the bottom here that you'll wanna remove yourself, okay? This came off with the back fat, with the uh, cap here. So I just removed it, but it's completely gone. This generally, I mean, there's a little bit of meat on it, but you can trim it down and save some of the meat if you wanted to use it in a stew. There's not a whole lot there, and, and there's a lot of connective tissue and nerve. So uh, you might be able to render it down and use it in some of the sauce, but for me, it's discarded, okay? So the next point, what you want to do, and like I said, realistically, there are people that would take the lamb as is and maybe just taper some of the fat here and sear it and, and uh, serve it as is, just like that. But I tend to want to take the fingers down just a little bit more. So what we use in the industry, we use a boning knife. I prefer a stiff boning knife for getting in between the fingers here, but I do want it to be fairly slim, okay? So I want to make sure that's very sharp. Okay? And what I'll do is, uh, when I'm teaching somebody initially when they're learning how to clean lamb, I'll tell them to mark the point just above the eye because you wanna cut into that prized meat. You're gonna mark one side, mark the other side as a young apprentice, and then you're gonna follow that line straight across. Okay, and that's gonna give me a guideline as to where I'm cutting. Then I'm gonna turn my knife 90 degrees, and I'm gonna turn out towards the front of the bone, and I'm gonna remove this here. So what I'm left with now is just some of the, uh, the bone and some of the fingers that we talked about that are coming in between here. Turning the knife towards the bone, I'm gonna gently cut down to the edge of the loin, of the eye there. Do the same on the opposite side, cut across, and that's just gonna release that little finger, and it's gonna leave it French, and it's gonna present much nicer because now it's just the eye, okay? So I'm gonna do that for all seven uh, in-betweens here, seven fingers. all along and this is mainly for aesthetics so this is the way I want it to present and the way I want it to look at the end uh, but there's nothing wrong with the meat that's in between those bones it's completely fine but it's it's really for a presentation okay so I've removed all the fingers now what I would do and I've, I've done in advance for the other pieces is I would take and I would either scrape using the back of my blade being very careful and scrape the bones to remove all that residual meat and that on the bone so that the bone is perfectly clean. You can also use in the industry, we use a piece of butcher twine. We also use uh, some wire, twist it around the bone and pull, and it'll pull it up. Or if it comes with the full cap on, there's a little trick that we use cutting down the back of the bones. And then we'll use an uh, in-between, sometimes I use my steel being honest with you hitting it down and then just cutting across. And when you pull back that cap, it comes completely clean, okay? So now that this is like this, you'll see there's a little bit of an edge of fat. All I'm gonna do is taper. And what I mean by taper, I'm just gonna bring a little bit of that fat down so that I got rid of most of the fat there. And then when somebody's eating that in the dining room, it's all full uh, portion, okay? So it's all meat as opposed to the meeting into a lot of fat which can be a little bit difficult when you're in a dining room, okay? So like I did mention to you, I had it done in advance. So what we did yesterday, and I'm just gonna move this out of the way for a second, is I'm gonna ask Billy just to focus over here for a minute, and you'll see over here, I have it in the immersion circulator. So what I did was, uh, we'll talk a little bit about sous vide. So sous vide is, uh, essentially it means under pressure. Uh, you're taking a protein, you're putting it in a cryovac bag, it goes in uh, submerged in water, you set the required temperature, and I could take the lamb out of there and it'll be a perfect just over rare because I set it for just over rare, but it will remain constant temperature the whole time and will not go above that, okay? So whatever I'm setting that temperature for, it doesn't matter if I have it in there for 30 minutes, for four hours, for three days, it will always stay at a perfect constant temperature, the temperature I decide, okay? Uh, working with sous vide is a godsend for the kitchen, quite honestly, it really helps us. We use it a lot in banquets. That's a very expensive sous vide machine, uh, but you can buy ones. I actually saw a Canadian Tire the other day, so you can buy $100 units. I'm not sure how well they perform, but uh, there are some links that I could give you in advance that. Uh, you can get a half decent unit for about 150 bucks, use it at home, and you look like a pro when you're cooking uh, for your guests. Everything is cooked perfectly every time, okay? So there are tricks that we use in the kitchen as well. 
So because I'm sous vide that, that one is probably the one I'm going to crush and show you. I just wanted to prepare for you guys. I do not have a cryovac machine at home. So yes, you can use a Ziploc bag. So we used a Ziploc bag. I double treated this so that I put it inside another bag. So I have the original bag that it came in and I'll just get rid of this. And the original bag that it came in, again, I don't have cryovac, so I just sealed them so it would not open. And what we did is we sous vide this particular lamb uh, for at uh, 127 for about an hour and a half, okay? No seasoning, I mean, there are different uh, reasoning behind seasoning and no seasoning. A lot of people do season when they put it in sous vide. I prefer to season at the end so I have more control, but you can season in the bag as well. I just prefer not to. It tends to draw moisture from the protein and that's something I want to avoid, okay? So in terms of what we did in the bag, all we did is we put some of the flavor profile that we're gonna be cooking the lamb. So for example, we have all the lambs I'll show you here now. I did flip my board, so it's not raw protein to cook protein. This protein is cooked, okay, even though it does not look like it, because we did not sear this one. I just put a couple of stems of rosemary, some bay leaf, some olive oil, and that is it. So we just wanted some of that flavor to permeate through but this lamb has been cooked to rare. I'm gonna sear it up and caramelize it, show you how we season it, and then that way you get a chance to see how quickly it cooks, okay? So first things first, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna put this lamb back in the fridge, the original one. And with this lamb, and if you don't mind, could you pass me a plate, please? With this lamb, what I'm doing, I'm just gonna start some of the seasoning process, okay? So with this particular lamb, all we're gonna do, I'm gonna put it on my plate here. I'm gonna get rid of this cutting board. Okay, and all I'm gonna do, I'm gonna get rid of my gloves as well at this point. And all we're gonna do is we're gonna season it up uh, with a little bit of salt and pepper. And then I'm gonna finish it after with the um, fresh herbs that we're gonna be using, okay? So some of the fresh herbs that we're gonna be using after. So right now, it's just gonna be salt and cracked pepper. Okay. A good amount of salt and cracked pepper. I'm going to sear it first, and before I put it in the oven, I'm going to put my fresh herbs on it, okay? I don't want to sear it with the herbs. I want more of a chimichurri effect when I put it on there, okay? And a little bit of olive oil. And that's all I want to do right now. So, Billy, if you want to follow me over to the stove, we're going to get this seared in the oven, and then we'll move on to our next step, okay? So I have my oven preset. My oven is preset 350 degrees. And all I'm gonna be doing is bringing this lamb up to temperature, okay? So all we're gonna be doing is bring it, because it is cold now, so we're just gonna bring it back up to temp. So what, what is missed sometimes with sous vide is when you're cooking in the bag, you're missing that caramelization on the outside of the protein. And it really does make a difference. So what I'm redoing here, this is called reverse sous vide, or I call it reverse sous vide, is I sous vide it without searing it first, take it out, plunge it in an ice bath, cool it down, hold it on my station. And then what I would do at service is I know it's already cooked almost under rare. I would sear it and get the caramelization on the outside, take it out, let it rest, and then when I let that rest, that's when uh, all the juices come back to the center, and then I'm able to plate it and present a beautiful plate of lamb, okay? And there's also some talk about whether or not you cook lamb on the flesh, on the bone, okay? I prefer to, to uh, cook it in the oven the other way around. The reason that is, is I don't wanna force cook 
the protein, because it's just protein, there's not a lot of fat protecting the top now, I've removed that cap. So all I wanna do is gently cook it the other way. So I'm gonna turn it onto the opposite side and let it cook that way in the oven, okay? So all I'm looking for is a really nice golden tin. I'm gonna sear that first side, get that golden color, turn it here, and then right into the oven. If I was cooking this lamb and I had not sous vide it before, for medium rare, we're talking 20, 25 minutes, potentially at 350. Uh, but for this, it's probably gonna take about eight minutes to warm right through. Hot in the kitchen today. Okay, so I have a little bit of a, a some color there now. That's the caramelization I'm looking for. I can do it a little bit more, but right now I'm just bringing that up to temp, and I do not want to overcook it. So that's going to go in my oven. Okay. Okay. Now back to the other side. Now we're going to start talking a little bit about some of the crusting. So for the crust that we're doing today, and I love this flavor on the lamb, is uh, we're gonna do a pecan breadcrumb crust, but we're gonna do a honey and mustard, uh, honey and mustard rub, okay? So for the honey mustard rub, very easy. A little bit of organic honey. A little bit of ground cumin. A little bit of uh, grainy mustard. Okay. Really simple, guys. And a little bit of salt and pepper. Okay. Whisk it together. I'm going to give it the taste, obviously. Give it a taste with my spoons here. Um, I'm gonna add a little bit more cracked pepper. Any question, how you doing, Sammy? You recovered for the last two days? And we're good, so the mustard is done. So that's the honey mustard for the lamb. Now what we're gonna prepare is we're gonna prepare the breadcrumb crust, okay? So for that I'm gonna need my garlic, my rosemary, some olive oil, and some uh, salt and pepper. This out of the way. There we go. Okay, so for the crumb crust, again, uh, what we've done is we've ground up some pecans. We took some fresh sourdough bread. We dried it slightly, actually, it was very fresh today. So we, we uh, dried it slightly so that we could grind it. I didn't want it too, too fine. But we did grind it down a little bit. So now what I'm going to incorporate is some of the pecans. Okay. Some of the parsley. 
a little bit of garlic, a little bit of salt. So I'm asked, do you want the rub more intense or less intense than the final taste you're looking to get? You know what, I really want to taste the lamb, so I think it should um, accentuate the flavor, should help the flavor, but not take away from the flavor of the lamb. I'm paying for the lamb, I really want to taste what I'm paying for, right? So all the flavors that I'm using are flavors that will, sorry guys, it's hot in here today, are flavors that will work and help uh, accentuate the dish, not uh, overwhelm the dish. Also to answer your question to him, he said no, not yet. No, not yet? <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry, you just grabbed the bowl. So this is gonna go in the bowl here, just it's a little bit larger than I thought it was. I'm gonna add a little bit of that olive oil. That's just to bring the crumb crust together. Combine, and again, like we said, layering flavor, we wanna taste everything. So we wanna make sure the seasoning is here. Everything should taste good, okay? So you don't wanna uh, put too much oil, so I don't want it to be a completely wet mix, but I do want that it will hold together for me, okay? So I'm just going to taste this. Yeah, I think that's nice. If you wanted to incorporate some of the cumin, you could as well. You could put some of the cumin into the crumb crust, but for this one I was more interested in the pecans and, and all the other flavors that are going on. So for this one I didn't, okay? So we'll just get rid of some of this as well. So in terms of the uh, accompaniments for this dish too, we uh, decided that we were going to use some spring vegetable. The only vegetable that I could, that I did not get, and I put it down as one of the ones that you could try to get, is salsify. I'm not sure if anybody has had salsify before, but it's absolutely delicious. Uh, it's a, a root vegetable. It uh, actually it's very ugly. Uh, black root vegetable. Uh, pale on the inside, but very knobby. Uh, it's usually, it's also called oyster root because of the comparable flavor to oysters, but it, uh, it's delicious and goes fantastic with lamb as well. Okay. So what we're going to do now while all this is happening, we're going to talk a little bit about our galette. Uh, Sam says oyster plant. Oyster plant as well. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. So for our galette, we talked about uh, animette or julienne vegetable. Uh, so julienne is a finer uh, cut than this. I talked about alumet. Alumet actually translates to match or matchstick. So uh, what we're doing when we produce these galettes is we're producing a matchstick or, or uh, about the size of a matchstick, okay? Like that. I'll show you how to produce that as well. So I've taken the time ahead to blanch these in boiling salted water. So you have to be careful because they are thin so they'll cook through quite quickly. So what you'll want to do is um, boiling salted water in and take it out and don't refresh it at all, just put it on a tray. I put it on a clean towel after I strained it, just absorb any more liquid, okay? So these are blanched but the squash itself is not blanched, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna put some of that cooked potato in with the raw squash. Okay. And then again, we're going to be building a lot of the flavors we talked about. So we're using rosemary in this dish. We're using garlic. The major difference here, and I'm going to go over to the um, go over to the oven now and produce that chimichurri that we're talking about, is I'm going to uh, saute it in a pan and then I'm gonna add it to the potato dish, okay? So let me just get that organized for us. Rosemary, some parsley, some garlic, and the olive oil. Okay, so we're just moving all of this over here now. I'm gonna turn off, we talked about brown stock, I actually made a brown stock this morning, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> But what we're going to do now is just sweat off those vegetables 
and it'll give us a little bit of uh, aromatics in the potato cake. So galette essentially means cake. And uh, in a French form, it's usually a pastry-like product, but we're using it uh, as a potato cake for the, the base of the dish, okay? So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to add a little bit of garlic to the hot oil. Just start sweating it off. I'm going to use the exact same uh, chimichurri, or uh, sorry, the exact same saute of the vegetables here, and I'm going to add that to my uh, lamb dish, onto the lamb. Okay, there we go. At this time, what I'll probably want to do is turn my water on in the back here and just start getting it very, very slowly heating up to get our vegetables ready. My lamb will be coming out of the oven very shortly. And when it does come out, I'm going to probably use the probe just to check the internal. And I'm going to rest the aromatics out. And then I'm also going to hit it with a little bit of parsley. Okay. I'm going to put a little bit more olive oil here. I'm going to season this up. So again, we're going to season this up. I'm going to turn off my heat now. All that's really nice and aromatic. Good amount of seasoning. Okay. A little bit of pepper. Good. And I'm just going to put a knob of butter in there as well. Okay. And that's it. So I'm going to take that off the heat, go back to the potatoes, and I'm going to show you how we finish them. Okay, so for the potatoes, I melted down the olive oil, melted down the butter. I have the aromatics of the herbs here. I'm just gonna take some and spill into the potato dish here. And I'm gonna reserve some for my lamb. Okay, so I'm gonna reserve that for my lamb. And we talked about having a little bit of mashed potato. The reason I use mashed potato, you can use flour, but I'm using mashed potato to help combine and bring it together. Okay. So this is just cooked potato, no cream, no butter. It's just potato itself. I'm going to mix this through and I'll show you the basic consistency. Some salt and pepper. Okay. Salt and pepper. We're going to bring that together now. So I'm just going to bring this together. <coughs> oh, bless. oh, bless you. My sous chef is sneezing all over the food in the back. That's not true. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to bring that together. And I'm just going to get a shaper, and I will show you the shape of the galette. Easier to use my hands versus this little spatula. Let me just get my glove going here. There we go. I need bigger gloves, Sam. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so I'm just going to incorporate this together. I am trying not to mash it, but I am bringing it, make sure it coats all the potatoes. Okay, you're gonna see that what's, what's happening is it's coming into a form, like you don't want too much potato, so you don't want it to be all mash, but you want it to be able to come together and form a cake, okay? So you can see if I ball this together, it does make a cake. I'm gonna taste it for seasoning, okay? And then ahead of time, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make shape it in a mold, so I have a mold here. Okay. I'm going to unmold that. And then that cake, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sear it in a pan with some olive oil, gold in both sides. You can either finish it in the pan or I've pre-made them, I'm going to finish them in the oven, okay? So that's the potato cakes. 
and now we're going to get back to the lamb on the other side. Sorry for bouncing back and forth. This is the design of this kitchen, unfortunately. Uh, but it's a lot easier for me to talk to you guys on this side and it work from the other side. Okay, so we'll go back to the other side. I'm going to take that lamb out of the oven and let it rest. Okay. So the lamb's been in the oven for about 10 minutes. I'm going to take it out. And like I said, because it has been sous vide, that lamb is ready to go. Beautiful color on the underneath here. Nice color on the top. I'm going to rest it upright like this. I'm going to rest it for about 10 to 15 minutes to allow the lamb and all the juices to go back together. And then we're good to go, okay? But I'm going to show you with the chimichurri what we do next. So as that lamb is resting, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add some chimichurri. I'm going to add some of that chimichurri, or sorry, the, not chimichurri, like a chimichurri, the herb. I'm just going to let it rest on top of the lamb here. Okay, just like that. Okay. So I'm going to let that rest, and then the final stage is I'm going to crust it, fire it back in the oven just for a couple of minutes. I'm going to put the crust on, uh, fire it back in the oven, and then allow it to rest a little bit more as well. Okay? But the crust is just to slightly brown the crust, and, and uh, everything that's in the crust is all ready to go. So it's just to really give it a little golden edge. Okay. So in terms of the crust, the honey mustard goes on the lamb, okay, just like that, and that breadcrumb is just going on the outside as well, okay. So I'm just going to coat the outside with that beautiful pecan crust. And you can see how well it's coated. There we go. So with that lamb now, with the crust applied, we can just put it back in the oven and we're going to brown up that crust, okay? At the same time, the galettes that I made ahead of time and I pre-seared, I'm going to start warming up those up in the oven as well. I'm just going to move my rack over for resting. And we'll start getting our vegetables organized for plating. So this I've got here, ready to rest the rack of lamb. I'm going to set up everything for my vegetables. When they come out, we're ready to plate. We're going to talk a little bit about the vegetables that I'm using today. So I am using, and again, I prepared them all in advance. So I have some uh, baby carrots, heirloom carrots. I have some asparagus. I have some beautiful king oyster mushrooms. Uh, because we have squash in the potato, I thought it'd be nice to do some nuggets. I have some roasted cipollini onion, and I have some Swiss chard, so I've been busy, okay? So I'm just going to bring this over to the oven. We'll start up our vegetable, and we'll start uh, finishing our sauce. So we talked a little bit about uh, vegetables. So the only ones I'm going to really need to finish here would be the asparagus at this point because everything else is, sorry, the asparagus, the mushrooms, and the chard. Everything else I have preset. So I'll just be dropping those in water and sauteing. Uh, but everything else is ready to go. Swiss chard, I'm just going to lightly wilt. Uh, Swiss chard is actually from the beet family. Uh, it's grown for the leaves, very similar to beet greens. Uh, spinach, uh, mild bitterness, but not as bitter 
as say a kale, okay? Uh, but fantastic as a base for this dish, need a little green vegetable. And I'm just gonna start up the sauce. I need a sous chef today. Bring that in a pot. Okay, so we're just gonna start developing a little bit of color here. Uh, we also picked a really nice uh, Shiraz for the red wine that we're using to make it. We have garlic and rosemary as well, and bay leaf. I don't want the fire alarm to go off. Okay, so once you've started to develop a little bit of color, we're gonna start sweating our shallots. Let that sweat off a little bit until they become translucent and develop a little bit of flavor. Then we're going to add our garlic in. Okay. Really smells great. You're going to deglaze your pan with some good red wine. And you're going to reduce that till about half, okay? Remember the rosemary stems in the beginning when we chop, uh, take herbs off stems? I can use some of those in the base sauce. Bay leaf. And then what I'm going to do, because that brown stock has been simmering in the back just so that there's no skin, I'm going to make sure that I strain it. And then all I'm going to do is I'm going to let that reduce, okay? So I'm going to put that in the back and allow that to reduce now. As far as my lamb goes now, I'm going to take that out of the oven. Okay, it has a little bit of a brown crust. I'm going to allow that to rest on the other side. And now we'll get on to our vegetables. The only thing we're going to do in a separate pan will be the Swiss chard. We're going to turn the oil, the uh, pan on, medium to low, and start sweating off in a little bit of olive oil and a little bit of garlic. and a little tiny bit of garlic. And I take that Swiss char that I had going, all nicely washed and trimmed. We're just gonna sweat that off a little bit, a little bit of seasoning, medium to low heat. And we're just gonna allow it to wilt in the pan, okay? So in terms of the other vegetable, so we're going to wait till that water is very close to a boil now. We're going to get our other large pan happening. Again, medium to low heat. There's no need to be uh, working it too fast. Good olive oil. 
And then we're slowly going to start with the vegetables that we already have cooked. Okay. I'm going to start on this side of the pan with some of these cipollinis, some of the squash. I'm going to add one of the mushrooms. Actually, why don't we add two of the mushrooms? Just to get some color. And we're going to add a couple of the carrots, okay? As soon as that water comes up to a boil, then we're going to start dealing with our asparagus, okay? So just olive oil in the vegetable at this point, salt and pepper, and at the end we'll hit it with a little bit of a knob of butter, okay? Swiss char is pretty much there. Part of my back. Again, just wilting. I can cover it, hold it to the side, but it's essentially it's ready to go. Okay. So I have my carrots, my mushrooms going, my water in the back is almost there for the asparagus. And make sure that I'm stirring the vegetables the whole time. Just so that we get some color. Mushrooms are searing. Lamb is resting. And we're basically there. of butter. Potato galettes are in the oven ready to go. I'm going to be taking those out shortly as well. just about there, so I'm going to drop in four pieces of asparagus. You can use a little bit of the water, residual water from the vegetable, from the blanching. And I can add it into my vegetables as well. Finish the asparagus in the pot. Shut that off, and we're pretty much there, guys. My sauce is almost there. So we're going to go over to the other side now, Billy, and we're going to start plating, okay? Let me just shift a couple of things around here. Sam, you're very quiet today. Smell-o-vision, buddy. It's ready to go. The vegetables are ready. I'm going to bring over my Swiss chard and we'll start plating.
Okay, lambs rested. Let me just make a little space here. Okay, so in terms of the plating, what I'm choosing to do is use the galette as an off-center point. So we're just going to go slightly off-center. I bring some of my vegetables here down along the plate, so I'm not necessarily going to put them uh, potato, vegetable, start, uh, protein. I'm going to have it coming cascading across the plate. It is so hot in here today, I don't know what's going on. Do you find it hot in here today, Billy? A little bit. A little bit. So for the Swiss char, we're just going to go off center, just pull it across the plate here. I'm going to get rid of all these pans. Sam says, yeah, 2020 and no smell of it in your flying cars. <laughs> So that lamb has rested beautifully. We're just gonna take the first rib. So on this side, I would use the whole bone. On this side, I'm just gonna eliminate the first bone, okay? This is usually what I share to the team. But you can see it's cooked beautifully, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give uh, either a, a th three bones or I'm gonna give two two bones. But I think for this presentation, I'm gonna give just a really nice three bone presentation, okay? The lamb itself, because it's rested, you can see the color. I mean, absolutely beautiful, okay? I'm gonna put this down so I can show the beautiful uh, lamb itself. So I'm just gonna present it like this. I'm gonna move this out of the way again, part of my back, so you guys can see. I'll get rid of the lamb, that's for later. And I'll bring over some sauce, and we will finish this dish, okay? is incredible okay so I just produced the sauce I uh, typically I would strain it and maybe finish with a little bit of butter but right now we're just going to drizzle some of that lamb goodness around the side there I don't want to cover up the lamb itself the color is so beautiful I don't want to ruin that okay and then uh, a nice garnish. I don't think this needs anything, to be honest with you. The lamb is the showcase here, but that's your dish. So Ontario lamb with potato squash galette, heirloom carrots, cipollini onions, and a pecan mustard seed crumb crust. Okay, thank you very much, guys. Talk soon. Uh, we are back next week. We're gonna be back next week. I've had a good friend of mine request uh, tuna niçoise, so classic French dish. We'll do it with a twist. And I just wanted to talk for a second uh, regarding the uh, leftover food challenge. So uh, we had a tough decision. We had a, couple, a few staff members that did uh, send in presentations. And the winner of the leftover food challenge, we have two. So Andreas Ramos from uh, the uh, Waves Casual Dining, as well as Lori Hobbit. So thank you very much, guys, for applying. You'll be getting a $50 uh, credit towards a pickup order or uh, an order from one of our local suppliers. So thank you so much and take care. See you next